everybody. A warm welcome to all of our students, to the members of the Cornell Hotel Society, Alba Adria and Eastern Europe uh, chapter, who are with us here tonight. A warm welcome to my colleague Florian, who's joining us. And last but not least, obviously, to Michael Cortelletti, our distinguished speaker tonight. I'm very, very pleased you're here, especially after a long day of teaching, uh, giving another lecture that's uh, stretching it quite a bit, but we just can't get enough uh, of you here at Madhul University. Michael has a number of degrees, two Master of Science degrees, one in political science and one in uh, tourism economics from Bocconi University in Italy. He then uh, got an MMA to Master of Management in Hospitality from uh, the renowned Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He started his career with Nordsee, and then he conquered the world basically with uh, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, holding a number of positions, uh, the last one being director of Europe, Middle East, Africa, India, Spain, a few more countries. And 2009, he took over his family business, which uh, is Koti restaurants, uh, three restaurants in Verona in Italy. He now lives between Verona and Berlin, and since that's not enough, he is also teaching in our four-year BBA here at Modul University. And it's a special honor and pleasure to welcome you here tonight, and I'll hand right over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Dry. Can you hear me well? Is this the right distance? Yes. Yeah? Thank you. I, I rely on your feedback. Feedback is important. Um, also for ethical decisions. Um, what Hani said is not true. Let's be clear. Uh, I have three degrees too many. Uh, I didn't conquer the world. I was just barely an agent of globalization. And yes, I'm running my family business and uh, that has been uh, fun and honoring and sobering ever since. Um, today for me, or better tonight for me, is really a very personal topic. So I'll be very open, I'll be an ethical salesman and tell you what I'm gonna try to sell to you. I'm gonna try to sell to you that this is a relevant question for the rest of your life. You're business students, right? Yeah? Good. How many of you want to become either managers or entrepreneurs? By show of hands. So pretty unanimous. So you're gonna be a business person. So this question matters to you. Can you be a successful business person? Successful and also a good guy? an ethical person. I've been a business school student for many years, an executive and now an entrepreneur, and this question still haunts me today. I'm not gonna give you answers today. I'm not even gonna give you my answer. I'm not gonna give you tools. I'm not gonna give you models. I'm just gonna show you how relevant the question is and how complex it is. We all have an innate sense of what is good or wrong. So let's start. How many of you think the right answer to this question is yes? Let me see the hands. Okay. And how many of you think it's actually no? Ah. So there is some skeptical thinking. Good. So, let's see if I can find something to write. Well, I have from my previous lesson. So, some of those who said yes, can you give me an idea of why it would be yes? Some ideas? Why do you say yes? Why can I be successful and ethical? Then you are able to balance ethics 
In my yeah, but if I don't care about ethics, I'm going to make more money, I'm going to be more successful, bigger bonus, invitation to conferences. In That's what successful is in business, right? I think you can use your success for like positive things. Okay. Like actually be ethical and support those good ideas. So you can use profit for something good, right? Some more ideas? They do what, sorry? Uh, I don't know how to say it. It's like, I think there's very, like I said, other manager out there who are ethical, and when they see us students, if we can be ethical as well, then they will promote us as well. Okay. So there is kind of like a support between the likes. Okay? So you can be successful because there are other ethical people there who will provide you a network of support. That's an interesting idea. It's true. People go in certain industries because they have inclinations. If I decide to affiliate myself with Mafia, I marry their ethical values. Very different. Some other ideas? I think if you have ethical, then you can build up your trust and the honesty with your business partner somehow, then of course can lead you to I heard Two great things. Trust, long-term success. Okay, now let me hear some opinions from people who are on the skeptical side. There you go. Uh, well, basically you, as a successful businessman, you, you have to make compromises that will affect people's life in a negative way and that can be considered very unethic, unethical in some cultures. And yeah, and it's, it can be very hard decisions to make. Yeah. And for some people, it's not hard at all because some people are psych psychopaths. Yeah, they don't care about compromises. Okay, but yes, you do have to do compromises. But doing compromises doesn't necessarily mean you're unethical. Depends on how you do them, right? I just want to say that even if you're making a decision that might hurt somebody or you seem to be unethical, if you support it with some kind of a like, really valid reason why am I doing it, then you could be seen as an ethical person. Although it sounds really bad. No, keep, guys, keep this in mind. You know? uh, you're hurting some people, but you have valid reasons. This is an interesting tension. We'll come back in our presentation to it. But some other reason why specifically you think this is not possible? Well, I think that ethics would change from country to country and that it's not possible to um, be an ethical person in every single country on the world or all around the world. Ah, the global component. This is interesting. There is also debate on whether there are global values or not that can be shared. Um, some other ideas why business and ethics cannot be reconciled. Okay, so let's start on this. You remember one of your colleagues said you can use profit to go do good things? Well, this is definitely one of the major arguments for those who believe it's possible. I'm a successful businessman, and I use my profits to do great things. The so-called good deeds. So let me introduce you to a gentleman from my country, Francesco Di Marco Dattini. This guy was a very, very successful Goldman Sachs bank here in the 1400s when you didn't have Goldman Sachs. During his lifetime, he used his money to fund a foundation, a hospital for poor people in Florence. When he passed away, when he died, he left his entire assets, which were pretty significant, to this hospital. 
the hospital and the foundation exist today. And his idea has blossomed. Let's move to today. Meet Mr. Excel, Bill and Melinda Gates, the largest foundation on earth. When they created their foundation, they set out a goal. They said, I want to change how charity is done. I want to do objective, measured charity work. I want to measure the success of charity work. So another gentleman, Warren Buffett, said, I'm impressed by this, because you know, a lot of charity work cannot be measured. A lot of charity work done by the UN is actually very corrupt, unfortunately. Warren Buffett was so impressed, he decided to donate most of his assets to this foundation and not even ask for the addition of his name. I think $40 billion, which were added to the $40 billion of Bill and Melinda, which makes this foundation the richest, more powerful charity organization in the world, more powerful than the UN. I've done some work on one of the projects that they have financed. They really want business plans. They're changing the game. Definitely here, profit is changing things for good. Now, do some of you recognize these logos? So, can somebody tell me what they have in common? Nobody remembers? Ouch. You see? That's why it's so tough to be an ethical businessman. You're not rewarding the ethical ones. These three companies are responsible for some of the worst business scandals of our last 10 years. That's what they have in common. The Enron scandal was so bad, Enron was totally wiped out. Parmalat is probably 20% of its original size. It was the worst scandal in Europe ever. And Siemens was the most far-reaching corruption scandal in the world, backed by the government of Germany and by the laws of the government of Germany. So the fact that you don't know this demonstrates how difficult it is for a manager to say it's worthwhile to be ethical. Siemens is still struggling to recover profits from that scandal. What else do they have in common? And this is more difficult for you to know, but I'm quite disappointed you didn't know the other thing. What else? They are all three great corporate charity donors. Enron was the biggest charity donor in Texas before it folded. Parmalat financed 80% of cultural, social activities in the city of Parma. Poor people in Parma now know what it means to be poor because Parmalat can no longer support those programs. Siemens has an amazing charitable foundation that does world work around the entire globe. So, you see, just doing good deeds is not enough. Actually, behind some of the greatest donors are some of the worst offenders. So, any idea of how we can make business work with ethics? facing this situation? Come on, any suggestion? Did I scare you because I'm disappointed you don't remember the scandals? I'm not so bad, come on. Ethical salemanship, I told you what I'm trying to persuade you about. So no risk on your part. It's not about exams. Give me some ideas. How do we get out of this quandary? You have a great company doing great profits like Siemens and donating a significant chunk of money for charities. But they're making their profits with corruption. How do you tackle that? 
And that's the typical answer. So let's look into it. It's a very smart answer, and it's a good answer. We'll see. It has its problems. Yes, business and ethics can be reconciled. You actually shouldn't focus so much on doing good deeds. You should first and foremost focus on respecting the rule of law. In fact, there is even a gentleman who said, the most ethical thing a business can do is do profits following the law and then let the shareholders do the charity work, okay? So notice it's not the Microsoft Foundation, it's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this idea is a very appealing idea. It relies on the Western understanding of law, which is a powerful understanding, which has helped us develop extremely efficient societies. And this picture symbolizes our understanding. The law is something written, therefore transparent, for all to see, set, known in advance. You know it before you do things. And then you have a judicial power who balances right and wrong, judges independently, and has an executive power to take decisions that can bind even governments. You bring a lawsuit against the US government, you win, you are binding the US government. That's how it works. The most powerful government of the world is bound by those books exactly like you. And this is a powerful idea because it relies on a lot of Western philosophy that says we have a right to be happy, individually happy, right? Wouldn't we wish that feeling every day? You remember feeling like that with your dad or your mom? You can tell I have two children, right? So this is a legitimate aspiration of each of us, to be happy. And what a better system than to say I pursue my happiness individually, a bit egoistically. I just need to respect the rules, and as a result, I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not being like Enron. I'm not being like Parmalat. If on top of that I do some charity work, well, even better. Now this idea works extremely well. So well that we have turned an eminently social and charitable activity into a profitable and respected business. Here come the insurance business. How many of you have insurances? Good. You're participating in a charitable activity. And why? Because in reality, by taking out an insurance, we're collectively protecting each other. You're doing it anonymously through a market system and through a legal system, but you're protecting each other. Because obviously, if thunderstorm would hit, all of us, the insurances would not have the money. Insurance have the money to actually repair your house if the thunderstorm destroys it, only because all of us are paying in. And our house is not close to her house. So, it's, it's really collaborative. It's very altruistic. So thank you for paying into your insurance program. It's helping me too. And all of this is market regulated. Fascinating. So ethics is actually working with profit. And the more profit they make, the more ethical they are in this mechanism. So follow the rules. You're on the right side. And the rules are clear there in the books, right? Crystal clear. We've got our answer. How many are convinced? Ah, you're starting to know me. I'm very transparent, I told you. So let's look at a different problem. This, this is legal in many countries. Legal. Would you hire those two guys? Yeah, would you hire them? Would you give them a job in your hotel? Cleaning the rooms? It's a better job than that one. No, you would still not. Why not? You don't feel good about it. 
Her innate feeling of good and wrong is telling her there is something wrong about child labor. Now, I'll tell you another personal thing. I was one of those guys. When I was 14, it was absolutely legal for me to work. To work in a kitchen, to work in front of a pizza oven, which was fired with wood, which had 600 degrees. I could burn myself, which I did very often. I could hurt myself, which I did very often. It was perfectly legal. I saw no problems in doing it. And I did it, and I enjoyed it. I did it on top of studying. Actually, it grounded me, kind of. <clears throat> Today, it's illegal. Our perception of what is right and wrong has changed. And we say no. In Italy, with 14, you cannot work in front of a pizza oven. You'll need to be at least 18. Okay? So it changes. But you see, here is the problem of just going by the rule of law. Who sets the law? According to which principles is the law oriented? And here comes actually the real topic of tonight. When we don't know how to set the law, we look at ethics. We have all used the word ethics today. Let's give it a bit of a definition. Ethics is the philosophy of moral action. Basically, it is a system of thoughts, a set of frameworks of models, structured models, to help you distinguish right from wrong. Now, ethics as a discipline has been founded by a Greek gentleman called Aristoteles. Funny enough, Aristoteles felt that slavery was okay. Nonetheless, he had a very high sense of ethics, and he developed a very sophisticated ethical model, which was way superior to any understanding of right and wrong in his time. Since Aristoteles, we have thought a lot of ethical models, and I will not bore you with any of them. But you'll need to know that you experience every day this. Why? Even if you haven't studied philosophy, you know about ethics. You know about it because you watch movies, you read books, you speak with friends, you got an education from your parents suggesting to you what's right and wrong. And so, in a practical, trickle-down fashion, all of these philosophical concepts came all the way to you. And a major tension in the world of ethics is between a utilitarian and a normative approach. It's also called consequentialism deontological. Basically, the utilitarian, you remember one of your colleagues said, even if you do something, you hurt a few people, you might do it because of a higher principle for a good reason. Hmm? The utilitarian will tell you, you always have to calculate all the pain and the advantages that you inflict. The normative will tell you, well, at some point, you need to set a principle. So yes, those guys, they might love those two children, they might love to do that work. Um, but at some point, we've got to draw the line. At some age, that's it. You can't take somebody 10 years old. Or you might say, I'll set it with 14 or 15. Or like in Italy happened, it switched from 14 to 18. So you have to take a step. This is where the normative approach comes in. This tension continues. And every time you are faced with an ethical decision, and every time as a manager you're going to be faced with ethical decisions, and trust me, every decision is ethical. Every single one. Because every decision can be right or wrong. You will fall into this tension. So let me go back to our children. Now, you're not giving him work anymore, right? 
because you're answering to a higher principle that children need education and not work. They need Moduli University, not field work, right? So, problem is there are no schools. These alternatives are BSS, begging, stealing, starving. So yes, we are answering to a higher principle, but the pain we are inflicting is severe. And I'm only showing you the begging pain, which is the lowest level of pain. Stealing is worse, worse, and starving is definitely the worst option. So I ask you again, who would give this guy a job? Who comes with me and gives him a job? Ah, ah, okay. Again, not so easy. But then come an additional consideration. Now, if we all give him a job, right? He's no longer begging, starving, or stealing. Do the politicians of this city, do they have a pressure to set up schools now? No. He's happy he's working with us. He's getting a training as a waiter. That's good. So there is a long-term damage we are causing now. Okay? Gosh, I was trying to make it difficult. Believe me, you it sound easier than it actually is. I've worked in many third world countries, and my franchisees had some of these kids working for them. I know how difficult it is. Uh, and don't misinterpret. I will be at times, uh, you know, pushing one argument to push another, not because I'm marrying it. Okay. So. It's true. There is an ethical value in offering these kids a work. It's definitely better for them. On the other side, how do you maintain the pressure on local authorities for them to establish schools? Is there a way to balance this? You know, you said about balancing. That's an ongoing process. Somebody talked about compromise, although in a negative sense, right? It's the same point, balancing and compromise. You're dealing with conflicting elements. And the fascinating thing is ethics is not giving you certainties. Please. Mm -hmm. Why don't you have to give the kids uh, uh, eight to five jobs, 40 hours a week, maybe just like a few hours so they can, they, they can help out and the other ones they can, can go to school if there is one? Absolutely. That's how you start going deeper into the problem and you start asking yourself, what can I do in this moment in time? Um, Although the issue of setting a principle at some point and drawing a line is still out there. And it's a very important issue. Because as the problem becomes more complex, you want to set some principles. Otherwise, you're going to be lost from one utility to the other. You're going to say, yeah, I'm going to give him 20 hours a week. But he's going to say, with 20 hours a week, I cannot buy my books for school. Let me do 30 and I'll go for night school. You see? So where's the slippery slope going? You'll need at some point to draw the line. That's why normative ethic is so helpful in these parts. The question is whether we choose the right parts. You know, I'm a classical guy, I come from Italy, so I like to think about Greece and Rome and what it teaches us. Um, do you all know who Alexander the Great was, right? Worst case from the Brad Pitt movie, right? Was it Brad Pitt? No, what was it? Was it Colin Farrell? No. Really? Okay. Brad Pitt was the other one with Troy? Ah, okay. So Alexander the Great invaded Asia. For that time, for the Greeks, uh, Anatolia was Asia. You know, the Greeks were having their days. You know, they, they had been beaten up by the Persians, and now they were coming back with brilliant vengeance. 
So he encounters a temple where there is a chariot. And around this chariot is a very, very tight knot. And there was at his time a legend around this knot. It was called the Gordian Knot. And whoever was able would be able to untie this knot would conquer Asia. That was the prophecy. Now the knot obviously was so complex you could not tie it. I'm a sailor and I know you can put together knots that you can no longer untie. And Alexander was brilliant. He reframed the problem, which is exactly what normative ethics does. Reframe the problem, elevate it, and he cut the Gordian knot. By cutting it, he untied it, he just did it in a different way, and he conquered Asia. So this story to me is, is always a great memento on how important it is when you're stuck to look for a new framework. So in the 60s, we were kind of stuck on the problem of child labor, and so we started thinking in terms of normative ethics. And probably one of the greatest philosophers on the normative ethics side is Kant. And two of his most fascinating and usable principles are here. One, universalize the principle of your action. You know, the principle behind your action of giving labor to these kids, if you universalize it, what's the implication? Is it coherent or not? And the second is always treat other people as an end of your action and not as a mean. That's a very tough one to respect, particularly when we talk about labor costs, right? Now, legislators worldwide looked at those principles and made a decision on child labor. They set a few conventions, the ILO convention, it's International Labor Organization convention, first in 73, then in 99, and the UN Convention on Child Abuse of 1990, they set minimum standards, so now it's legal to use child labor only starting from age of 13, and most countries in the world signed up to it. Um, it's difficult still to apply, exactly because you know, there are compelling reasons to actually make them work, and it's difficult to deliver education to all of them. Um, but the legislation taking a stance has actually accelerated the process. Because before that, we had a lot of cases of children of 6 or 8 or 10. So now we still feel uneasy about those kids who are 13 or 15 doing heavy work. Four years ago, the picture would have been different. They would have been much smaller. And I didn't show you those pictures because you are part of my generation, actually younger. And so for you, it's obvious that a child with six or eight years cannot do work. But the same arguments we discuss today were discussed 40 years ago about children with six and eight years of age. Well, for us now, it's an acquired fact that that's a no-no zone, right? Even for Turkey. It's actually well implemented in Turkey. So you see? We do create change. Your decisions matter. Your uneasiness or easiness of giving them labor 40 years back supported, enabled this decision. So we're slowly but surely moving from the yes to the no. Did you notice? Here you have a classic case where business would have said, you know what, it's legal. It was legal 40 years ago to hire six-year-old in India to do your beds in a hotel. It's legal, I do it. What's the problem? And now we have come to the conclusion, well, you know, neither doing good deeds nor, doing, nor following the rules really works. We have to ask businesses to refrain from profit and take a step back because of an ethical principle. So if you're saying that the business has to take a step back, what you truly are saying is, no, my dear, business success and ethics are not to be reconciled. There are times 
where you have to forego profit to uphold a principle. And it hurts. Because if I'm an unethical salesman, I might make bonus, and I might shake hands with the CEO. And the bonus is for my children, and I want to send them to private school, to module, to get a higher education, and have a better future than mine. You know? It's not just to go to Palma and have fun. I have a serious motivation and a serious process, pressure. So giving up on that costs, and costs a lot. And you prove to me how little worthwhile it is. Because you don't know that GE in the US, main competitor of Siemens, has implemented anti-corruption rules 30 years ago and since has ever started losing share, market share to Siemens and losing profitability to Siemens, year after year. And GE has been pushing the US government because can you imagine in Germany until eight years ago I could put on my balance sheets bribes and deduct them from taxes. You know that? So Siemens saved taxes for bribing people around the world and stealing unfairly market share from GE, which had superior products. Which means the healthcare in many countries is worse than it could be because of Siemens. I've spoken and I've met the head of compliance of Siemens. He told me what a mess it is to change a culture of corruption. We'll talk about corruption risks in our industry, and so you'll see how difficult it is also for the Siemens managers. I understand them a lot. But we have come now to this conclusion, right? And this conclusion says there are two mutually exclusive principles. Right? Profit maximization and greatest good for humanity. They actually compete for your attention. So allow me to bring this line of thought to a conclusion. And let's look at systems that tried to warn us exactly of this. So for the sake of tonight, I'm going to speak only about Christianity as a religion, just because I'm more familiar. Okay? So when I speak about religion and the action that religion had in the past on our understanding of profit and business, I'm just talking about Christianity. So religion has been warning us of this for a long time. Those of you who on and off read the Bible or listen to it have certainly heard this sentence. You cannot serve God and man. And we all know that mammon is money. This is exactly saying what some normative ethicists are saying, which is mutually exclusive principles. It's only saying it in a much more colorful and lively way. Right? Christianity has offered some really inspiring examples of a different lifestyle. You know, Francis of Assisi, the gentleman who inspired the name of the new pope. What a heroic life. Jesus itself and a lot of people who followed in his footsteps. Quite impressive. I look at those lifestyles and think, wow, those are great examples of love and generosity. Something that I'm probably capable to give only to my wife, my kids, and a restricted number of friends and family. How could they actually extend it to such a number of people. That's impressive. But here has been a philosophical thinking that for a long time has been saying, hey, guys, mutually exclusive principles. Did it take you so much to get it? I told you. Now, socialism, which we obviously don't like in a business school like ours, right? Socialism recognized the problem. Their attempt was to figure out a way to subordinate the energy of profit to the good of society. 
They somehow tried to tame the devil, so to speak. Their idea was, if I socialize the ownership, I can take the devil. It didn't work. We now, we now know it. But we, recognize, we must recognize it's been a generous attempt. Now, if you look at those you know, reflections on our work, how do you feel about being a business school student, about wanting to become a profit maximizer, about wanting to become an executive or an entrepreneur. How many of you feel absolutely good about it, still? Oh, oh, interesting. You still feel absolutely good. So you have a sensation that you can do it differently. Is that a fair assumption? I don't know, I just don't feel bad. Okay, cool. But a lot of you said, yes, they're reconcilable at the beginning. And now you have some doubts, at least some doubts, and I'm happy about it. And not because I'm convinced this is the truth. I'm just convinced that these positions have some legitimacy to it. They're not the ultimate truth, but they have some legitimacy. Stuart Mills used to say, if you know only your side of the argument, you know way less than 50%. Definitely not enough. And Stuart Mills was a major defender of freedom and individualism. So why do business at all if it is so evil? If it cannot be reconciled with being altruistic? If it would be much, much better to simply love everybody and just give? Why do business at all? Come on, we are at business school. Give me reasons to be at business school and to do business. Or should we just all shut our doors? To gain profits. To gain profits. But we, we notice profits are really bad. They, they, they are tempting you to hire children. They get you to cheat. Um, but that's the purpose of you know, doing business. What, cheat? No, gaining profits. Of course it is. Doing business is not, I don't know. To... Of course it is, but the whole point it's is... Bad. Is it a good purpose? It's a socially acceptable one. Okay, so now we have scaled down to socially acceptable, but I don't want to do something socially acceptable. Hmm? Please, I'd like to be a change maker in my society, not somebody who's just socially acceptable, barely tolerated. And by the way, why is it socially acceptable? Why is it tolerated? What do you think? Any ideas? Ah, thank you. Survive. Survival. You probably heard the word scarcity, right? Okay. One of our main tasks is to deal with scarcity. Right? So let me quote religion again. And for the, for the people here who know me well, I'm definitely not much of a religious person, but I find a lot of wisdom and inspiration. Um, I don't know if you can recognize from the picture what parable it is. It's the parable of the talents. How many of you remember it? One? Okay, so I better retell it in a shortened version, okay? So in this parable, what happens? Uh, the Lord, or a Lord who represents God, um, gives money to his servants and says, I have to go for a long trip, take care of my money. He gives them a lot of money, a talent, to one, he gives a talent of silver. To another, he gives three. And to the other one, he gives five. Now, one talent of silver at that time was comparable to five years' salary. Okay? Five years' salary as a good, uh, let's say, reception manager, you get them cash from your box, from your lord. And he leaves on a trip. That's one talent. The guy who gets five talents, that's a lot. That's 25 years. You can throw a serious party. The guy who gets five talents, and mind you, today we use the word talent to indicate an ability. At that time, everybody understood talent was money because things were calculated in silver talents. That's how the net worth of people was calculated. Today in US billions, at that time in silver talents. And it was used 
for millionaires, for rich people, because one talent was 14 kilogram of silver. And at that time, silver was much more expensive because you needed much more labor to extract it. So the guy with the five talents takes them, invests them in different businesses, and multiplies them significantly. I forgot, perhaps he doubles. The one with the three talents takes them just to the bank and gets a bit of interest. Kind of a cheap solution. The guy with one talent, he's really scared about the responsibility, takes it and digs a big hole and hits it, hides it. You see him there in the picture. You see he's checking his hole where he has put the money. Then the Lord comes back and he says, oh, my dear servants, what have you done with my money? And one says, hey, Lord, I took your five talents and you know, I sent shipments to Athens and Rome and here is the profit. Great, well done. Second one, I went to the bank and I got a good deal, 5% interest, here you go. Great, well done, actually, he gave him exactly the same compliment, which always puzzled me. He didn't do anything, he just speculated. And then the third guy brings back the talent and says, here, my lord, I preserved it for you, I defended it, I made sure nobody took it. And the lord went really, really angry. He punished him for that. And I never really understood it when I was a kid. This parable really bugged me. Why punish him? He didn't spend it. He didn't go to Palma. He didn't, you know, he didn't uh, throw a real strange party in Vienna, right? He just kept it. What do you want more? Now, the point is, he didn't use it. That's exactly the point. The talents are our scarcity, are the limited resources we have available. It's really money. And there isn't an infinite supply of money, despite of what the Fed thinks. There isn't. And you better make a good use of money. You better have an internal rate of return superior to that cost. Right? Otherwise, you're wasting money. So actually, even the Bible tells us that there are some moral qualities to business. And the moral quality, the first and foremost moral quality, is exactly this. And it's the moral legitimacy of our trade. We tackle scarcity. Through our process of competition, we make sure that a scarce resource, land and capital, is used as good as possible. Now, this does not free us from ethical constrictions and responsibilities, from rules and regulations, but this gives us a place and gives us a word at the table. Here is a legitimate moral action that has to be taken into consideration together with the others. And I would argue there is another value that business creates. Some of you said it about trust, right? About long-term success. Businesses somehow have an incredible ability to establish trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is a precondition. If I want to sell something to Christophe, he needs to trust me that I'm selling exactly what I'm saying and I need to trust him to pay me. It's a precondition and every time we do a transaction, we reinforce that trust. And the speed of the market drives trust. If I would have been a visiting merchant from Verona, in the 17 or 1600s, coming to Vienna to meet you, I would have my sword and dagger, right? Because as much as I trust the civility of Vienna, murder rates are much higher back then than today. And we actually know it because we have records about it. So trust has risen, and so I've come here to Vienna with no guns. Incredible. Texas doesn't have this level of trust. They still have huge amounts of guns. So trust is really a major value of business. And the hospitality business, particularly, has a task of establishing trust. It's a place where people from so many countries meet. The kitchens of your restaurants and hotels are a place of integration, my friends. So why do these people, and I've deliberately chosen somebody from an emerging market, huh? somebody who might be really tempted by a different model because they really know what poverty and sufferance is, why do they still prefer to work with us huh? 
the Agile Hotel and being a profit maximization organization as opposed to adhering to a religious organization or to socialism. Because as somebody said, we need to eat. And that's the big challenge of religion. As fascinating as the model of Jesus and Francis is, it's really, really a hard sell in terms of sustainability. It actually works well if, if you deliberately forego the idea of having a family. It might be.